Um, so this is the first interview that I'm doing on the Gaming Ballistic blog. I thought I'd try it out. Um, and naturally, since I write for GURPS and I love GURPS and I play GURPS, uh, I decided to uh, have the interview with Sean Punch, the uh, GURPS line editor. Given that it's uh, my favorite system and it's my go-to for my creative writing as well as my uh, role-playing, uh, I wanted to uh, chat with you, ask some questions, and uh, ask you both about GURPS as a system but also about the industry as a whole. Um, so just uh, getting kind of right to it, and, and briefly, since most people who come to my blog will do it because I talk about GURPS, um, since I don't think that there's much else about me that's going to draw people to say, what's Doug doing today? Um, what is GURPS, and, and what about it, uh, just talk about it uh, briefly as a role-playing system, just in case we have random strangers coming today. Okay, so if you're a random stranger, and you've played role-playing games but not GURPS, the important thing about GURPS is that it's generic, it doesn't have a preferred setting or genre or time period, that it's point build, so you're not rolling characters or whatever, you're using points to build your character to custom specifications and that it's based on entirely on the use of three six-sided dice. Uh, you determine reactions on those dice by rolling high, you determine assess on those dice by rolling low, and pretty much everything about GURPS can be traced back to these fundamentals. Uh, you build your character with whatever traits suit the genre that GM has picked. You pick that genre out of a hat if you like, but hopefully because you enjoy it, and hopefully because it's interesting. You build a setting using the elements of the system, and then you start gaming with it, with those characters you made. And the character's choices and abilities will be from a huge list that will hopefully be pared down by the GM's choices for setting and time period and so forth. And you apply them with points. So the points don't show up once you're in play, really. But you're rolling those three six-sided dice a lot in play against target numbers. You're trying to roll low, succeed. And that's the essence of it. And beyond that, it would get into particulars, and anyone who's a gamer but not familiar with GURPS is more than welcome to come to me and ask me those particulars, but I'm not going to take up Doug's time with that right now. So that actually uh, makes a pretty good segue into, I, one of the nice things about, uh, and I, you've used a particular phrase before about uh, either drinking your own bathwater or, or uh, uh, something like that, drinking your own Kool-Aid. Um, eating where, your own dog food. Eating that's your own dog food, food. that's their phrase of choice, that's right. Um, and you've posted several long-running campaigns and campaign logs. Um, so when you're talking about how things work in play and the rules and all that stuff, it's not just, oh, look, here's a, you know abstract rules meta system that's going on. You know, you do things. You play the game. Um, and so what do, you, what do you think the strengths of the system that you oversee are and how have you leveraged those strengths into these long-running successful campaigns? Okay, it's two questions. The, the strength of the system, I think, is the quickest one to answer. The strength is that it can handle anything, so if I get a crazy idea in mind, I don't have to seek out a system first. I have some friends who are very insistent on a new system for each new campaign, and I understand that that's part of the fun for them, but say you're strapped for time, short on cash, whatever, and as a freelance designer of games, I, I'm always strapped for cash and time. Um, you want to get something that can handle just about anything. So that's its big strength. It's a big toolkit. It's got all the tools. And as for how I make use of that, I mostly make use of it by just taking advantage of the fact that all those tools are there and I'm very familiar with them. And if I have an idea, I can usually realize it in rules terms in a matter of, often a matter of minutes. Uh, it doesn't take me very long to come up with a way to use an existing component, or if I have to fudge something together because it doesn't exist, then something that's close enough to what exists. That's really that's really the secret. Now, the secret to the long running part, I, I'm not going to say groups can take any credit for that. That's got to do with uh, that's got to do with finding group of players. That's a whole other conversation, really. <laughs> but I, I generally game with friends before I game with strangers. I generally approach a game as being long running to begin with. I don't throw out everything in the first five minutes. Just, I don't set off all my firecrackers with one big match. I, I like to have a long-term arc in mind. I like to move toward various waypoints along that arc. And I like to uh, respond to what the players are telling me, either outright or implicitly, with uh, changes to the campaign world so it keeps an interest for them. And in as much as GURPS is generic, can let me cobble together anything I want from tools. 
I guess it helps there because the players see me going in a direction that I perhaps didn't consider, or that maybe I wouldn't have considered. I can see it coming, and I can say, all right, there's a book for that, or there's a rule for that, or there's something that handles that, and I can go dig it out later, or even right now if no one sees me reaching for the rule book, and it'll give me that. Oh, fundamentally, I just said we, uh, you can reach for a rule book, I can reach for a rule book, and I can be fairly sure to either have what I need or the tools I need to improvise solution that matches what the players are asking me for, either outright or through their actions. That's all. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, I've seen on various boards and stuff is that, well, people never criticize GURPS. So I'm going to give us an opportunity to criticize GURPS. What do you think the weaknesses of the system are? Well, I... Like any system, it's it's first and foremost not perfect. It was designed by humans who could consider every possible case, no matter how generic the game is supposed to be, and they have biases. So, like any game, it's got it's got it privileges certain genres, even though it's supposed to be generic. It privileges certain scenarios, even though it's supposed to be generic. And it's only going to be as good as the people designing it when it comes to comprehension of things like math or science or whatever using to model the situation. Or not to be too quantitative about it, only as good as the, those the experience of the designers with various genres and, and genre fiction. You know, if I've never seen some anime someone's talking about, I can't promise you the system I've worked on will emulate things of that very well because I don't know anything about it. That's the big weakness, really, and it's it's shared among all role-play games, but it's especially noticeable for generic games because people often assume, rightly or wrongly, that generic means will handle anything. And I can come back to that later, but it comes down to, you no, know, it really doesn't mean that. It means it can handle most things passively well, but some things obviously you don't want to specialize genre for. Specific to GURPS, it's got a few m mechanical issues which make it less than perfect in some circumstances. Um, because all the task resolution is done on a 3D6 system, if you're not extremely conversant with modifiers that take probability ranges uh, way outside that to side into that range, then you can find yourself wondering, well, the limited range is restricted, why not? Roll, roll high, add, double up, whatever, to handle more range. And that's a valid criticism if you're not very comfortable with the system. Now, the system actually does address those problems with modifiers and with special cases for high skill. But in principle, yeah, it's a built-in, it's a built-in flaw of the system, and I won't deny that. And another thing is point build itself, because it has the implicit meaning of some kind. Some people like to say it means every character is equally powerful. Some people like to say every character is equally flexible, but whichever of those you choose, uh, it's not going to be entirely true that the power judgments or flexibility judgments will agree with any given person's idea of what's, what's best. And like all point builds, it's possible to come to degenerate cases where you're getting way too much for your points. And like all point builds, there's some things which really have no fair value. Being invulnerable has no fair value. Being able to emulate what anyone else can do has no fair value. Being a god really has no fair value. So with point build, you do have these situations where if you're going to be rigorous about using the points, you're going to always be kept away from doing certain things to the system, however generic it claims to be. Yeah, I remember uh, once in the old third edition days, I convinced my game master to give me the physical equivalent to eidetic memory, which was double or triple the points and blah, blah, blah. And boy, was he an effective 200-point character when something that was four times as expensive as mental skills got an additional multiplier. That, that was about my most shameless munchkin moment ever. There's um, an excellent example of what I mean, however. It's because it's point build, an awful lot of this, what's in the system is linear. It's linear in points. I mean, there's, sometimes there's an increasing scale, but fundamentally there's a scale, and it goes up with how many points you spend. And when you throw multiplicative effects on top of uh, an arithmetic, progression, a straightforward linear progression, or for that matter, if the progression is already multiplicative and you start throwing powers in there, right. it's going to break. And there's some scalings that require you to multiply or divide or use a power, and they're not going to work well, play well with uh, a different scaling. And the point system has to assume some scaling. So no matter what scaling you assume, it's always possible to go in order higher. It's always possible to decide that's too extreme and you want to go lower, and it won't work as well for you. That's unfortunate, but it's the way it is with generic systems. You right. can't really keep everybody happy at every scale all the time. Yeah. No, and I think that's true because, you know, you have a box of, of what, you know, and, and, and in a way it's a lot like the 3D6 curve. You have 
a place where it works and if you have things that are outside that place then you need to bring them in in order for everything to relate well you know an ant and a person don't do melee well <laughs> well the person might but uh, um, it, it's, it is a different scale it's okay well ant boot to borrow from Avengers because um, why wouldn't you borrow from Avengers um, anyway so um, in terms of strengths and weaknesses you know, the games that I've been playing recently are... I, I had one fun moment in, in Fate Core. I've been playing a little Gumshoe, which is really Trail of Cthulhu, um, and uh, a bunch of Pathfinder recently, and as well as playing a Pathfinder adventure using the Dungeon Fantasy uh, rule set, which rocks on toast, but we'll get to that later. Um, what do you think, relatively speaking, are, are these... Ah, strengths and weaknesses is the wrong word, but where do you think that some of those other systems that you might have experience with, and if you don't, you could ignore uh, that part of it. Um, where do you think it fits well, and where does GURPS uh, do better and worse, and, and um, or really, what is the feel, I guess, of each system? Maybe forget the better or worse absolute. How, do you, how does each system make you feel? <laughs> well, Things, class level type systems, whether you're talking about something as recent as Pathfinder, you go all the way back to AD and D first, or even to D and D, and all kinds of games in between. So I'll just take those games as a set of things. Sure. And you can, you know, you're, you're familiar with Pathfinder, great. I've read the Pathfinder rule book. I'm not that familiar with it in play, but I'm familiar with the fact that it is basically D and D 3.5 pushed to the future, and I read 3.5, and I've played every version of D and D. Those systems have going for them uh, the one big advantage you can jump in more quickly. Yeah, there's it's true that with all kinds of uh, there's all kinds of options for character improvement, and as you get on with very high level characters, it's a pain in the butt to keep track of it all. And there's 20 different ways to get the same result. Some are more efficient than others, but you can jump in initially. There's a known finite set of abilities, a known finite set of character options. You can jump in and start right away, and no one has to deal with weird corner cases or with their inability to do math or whatever. There's not that many things you have to pick, and most people coming to the table, even if they gamed in Hong Kong, if they gamed in, in Sydney, Australia, if they gamed in, gamed in Chennai, India, if they gamed in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, it doesn't really matter. They have all played that system. It's got a basic set of assumptions that everyone knows, and you can, provided you speak the language that's at the gaming table, you jump in and know that your wizard or your, your pirate or whatever will be, for lack of a better word, the same as any other wizard or pirate, modulo your specific preferences, picks and choices, obviously things like whether he's got a pointy goatee and likes a rapier better than an axe or whatever. But the key thing is that it's got this familiarity. It's got this quick start. Uh, not just in the sense the game's quick to start with, but also quick in the sense that the gaming group is easy to jump into. And groups doesn't have that. The GM has to set out what kind of characters are okay, take a huge list of abilities and pare it down to the ones that he or she wants to see in the campaign. Uh, players will have to deal with an awful lot of house rules because there's just too many corner cases to do with scale or technology level or whatever that the GM would have to come up with. And then you immediately have to say, okay, well, which of those are you using? What do they mean? And how to find out about them? And there are a lot of choices from day one. I mean, from, from, from the minute you start your group's character, even if it's a low power campaign, you get all these points to spend. And you spend them as small as one at a time, on one point skill or a perk or something. It could take you a long time to spend them all. If you're spending 50 points on 51 point items, that's 50 choices, where your Pathfinder character is not going to have 50 choices full stop, not even if you start a little above first level, which is not that many choices to make. Um, so there's that. That's the big advantage there. Now you get to something like Fate, which is another system I know about. I'd say Fate actually has about as much complexity as GURPS. A lot of people would argue with me on that, but I, I don't think I would step back from that argument. I don't think I'd step down because there's a surprising amount of stuff you have to pick in Fate. It's and they felt that the very straights fall into a surprising number of bins. Yeah, it's true. There's not necessarily depending how you set up the campaign. There's not necessarily attributes. There's not necessarily this interdependence of scores and other scores. But you've got all these different types of things. Each of which has a different dramatic role. There's quite quite a few possibilities. In the case of something, and some some of them, and some of them are completely player defined. Uh, GURPS has some player defined abilities, but they fall into narrower boxes. Not so in Fate. In Fate, you could literally find something yourself out of the blue from whole cloth, and you have to debate the GM what it does and what it's capable of doing. Fate also does not have the GURPS 
that to sort of design the Pathfinder style uh, ability to let you just jump in and know what's going on. Again, like GURPS, you have to set up the campaign, to decide what your genre and expectations are, what's going to be on the skill list, uh, what kinds of things you want people to have, how many how many stunts you want people to have, or whatever. Uh, and so there's that. The fate is strong in the sense that it's oriented toward dramatic play, which for an awful lot of players is much more important than mechanistic play. GURPS is very mechanistic. It's very realism-based. It may not be a realistic game. You finally throw in the superheroes and the talking snake men and the telepathic powers, but initially it's based on realistic roots. Fate doesn't come from there. Fate comes from dramatically appropriate roots, which is a very different origin. And well, players who are very quantitative thinkers and very interested in the realism of the real world, they, these people love GURPS. They don't necessarily like fate, and vice, vice versa. People like drama, who very much want their game to be like what they saw on the screen or in the book, are not going to like very much a system which restricts them based on what's physically plausible, as opposed to what's dramatically plausible. And fate does that much better. And I've played dozens of other types of game systems. I mean, there are game systems without points, but which still have builds. And there are game systems which have um, points, but no builds. The points are just used to pick out a very limited list of choices and so on. And they all have strengths and weaknesses of everything. But actually, I think those games we discussed, the class level based games and the dramatically founded games, are really the two biggest departures you can get from GURPS. The only bigger departures are games just to consider to be a little bit experimental. Like you get things where you do well together with dice rolling, or you get situations where everything is bid on instead of bought with points. And these are interesting as well, but you could sort of shoehorn them into one of these other molds, I think. Yeah, I think that uh, at least in, in my experience with the stuff that you've written, um, I thought that the Impulse Buys uh, book was a great leap towards. Uh, being able to have a mechanically based system that helped to facilitate more dramatic play. Uh, I know that uh, between that and uh, some of the stuff that uh, uh, Reverend Pete Kitty or Jason Levine has penned with destiny points and, and that we've gotten great mileage in the Dungeon Fantasy campaign with, uh, you know, oh, I swing and I miss. No, I don't, damn it. <laughs> I don't miss because it would just be way cooler to not miss here or it would be really stupid to die this way and so I'm going to exert a, a, a level of plot immunity uh, based on uh, these destiny points or, or luck or whatever. Um, so, you know, that's what I've found is, uh, at least my personal experience is, is that, you know, if you're willing to take a step away from the dice every now and then, GURP supports a lot stronger dramatic play than people would think. It does, and what my particular windmill, uh, what I like to charge at on my my fantasy horse when I'm not actually trying to get paid, is bridging that gap. I think it's actually possible to have a, a set of physical basics, a realism-based uh, foundation, and throw a dramatic blanket over it, and not have one or the other take over. I think it's actually possible to have them both working at the same time. On my previous campaign, my fantasy campaign, uh, I did a fair amount of that. I let people spend points for outcomes. And um, I had a lot of stuff be destiny driven. Their characters all had big destinies. And I didn't pay so much attention to character points. People had totals, but they changed a lot based on what I felt like the campaign was going to do at that moment in time. And yeah, I still had things like weights for swords and pounds of force for how much people could pick up and throw around. And people had certain heights and weights and so many dollars that. In, in, their, in their pouch and so on and I thought that was kind of a neat thing that you could have this fundamental realism at, at the root of the game and not have it confining the game just have it set the uh, I guess you could say the stop point or the, uh, the, the, the the one or the 11 on your volume dial however you want to look at it past which you can't go but a lot of things within that range to move around to be interesting yeah I uh, one of the things that always amuses me is uh when you've got something where you're like, yeah, you know, well, I have this advantage, and if I lose it, then I, th there better be something that comes back to me to maintain my point total. I'm like, you know, a couple of years ago, I busted up my neck pretty hard. And the next day, I did not win the lottery, representing the fact that I now had, you know, a neck injury. You know, so I guess I can buy wealth with the disadvantage that, uh, that I got when I lost the, uh, the fully functional neck thing. So, you know, that's I, I always have a good time when point totals fluctuate in play and 
and, and stuff like that. But you hit on a point which, which um, I know you and I have talked about offline. You know, so for those who don't know, Sean and I are not just strangers. You know, we write this. Is, I help. You know, I submit proposals and all that stuff. But we've known each other for remotely for years. For a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, but uh, anyway, we were talking about this, and the realism thing I think is key because. You know, it's right there in the in the uh, in the intro as a bit of fluff, fluff text that was written, you know, 20 years ago or more. Um, that you know, GURPS is realistic, and you've hit on it, and I've said it too. Plausible very Wow. All right. Let's see if I can actually say that. The appearance of being realistic, right? You know, it doesn't have to be actually physically real; it just has to feel that way. But so GURPS has that reputation for realism, and how important is realism to success in today's game industry? I, I think it's not nearly as important as an awful lot of people would like to think, and I'd argue even that perhaps it wasn't ever important. Uh, it's crucial to realize, poor choice of words there, but crucial, crucial to understand that realism was almost a fad when gaming first started. Now, I don't mean gaming on tabletops back in the day with Von Clausewitz moving around with ships or something. I mean when role-playing games first started in the 70s. They were, sure, they started in a war game, and the war game had some vague connections to reality. But you can look at those early, early incarnations of D&D, say, and you can realize even then there were wizards. There were people who were, simply put, they, this man was equivalent to 10 fighters. That's what his 10th level meant. He was a he was equivalent to 10 men. In real life, no one's equivalent to 10 men, and no one can work magic. So even in those early days, it wasn't terribly realistic. And throughout, the focus has always been on strange powers and unusual abilities. And when people have confined themselves to the real world, usually it's not the real world as we know it. It's usually the real world as depicted in action movies or something like that. Um, you get lots of systems out there which have wire foo, uh, action movie realism, Nobody can actually die or whatever, or they always win because of the heroes and the mooks just lose. It's still not realistic. It's just unrealistic in a different direction. Or you have people roll out uh, some of the so-called hard sci-fi games, or at least semi-soft sci-fi games, and say, well, this is realistic. It's got fashion like drives that sort of maybe could exist. And it's got it has maybe, vectors. Yeah, it's well, got vectors. It's got magic <laughs> and so on. But the thing is, it's still not realistic. It's, it's, what it is is, uh, I guess you could say it's a plausible model for an internal existing universe, but it's not realistic. Realism as such, I, I, I'd say, is very rarely seen in role-playing games. There's a few games out there which are tempted to bring realism to specific subsystems, what they do. There's, um, I suppose, I don't know how familiar you are with old-timey, or not so old-timey, but kind of obscure, but you ever hear Phoenix Command? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I've never, well, pl- I've never played it, but it's, it's very yeah. accurately how, what a firearm would do if it hits someone. Right. I mean, and I'd say it's probably very fairly real, realistic. And there's games like Riddle of Steel, which do a moderately realistic job of handling swordplay. They throw in a psych- psychological element, which is nice because that's often missing in role-playing game combat. But the over a lot, you know, the overarching systems in which people play aren't realistic. Groups really didn't claim to be realistic so much as found in realism. If you look at Steve's original intro, and I actually went back and reread that for this interview, because I was sort of curious. He doesn't ever actually say GURPS is a realistic game. He even admits you can do anything you want. You can be a wizard, you can be an alien. All kinds of things don't really exist. Uh, you can be a swashbuckler who could exist in the real world, but certainly not to be a cinematic success that swashbucklers enjoy in fiction. These things were all cited as examples of what you could do with the game. What he meant was that the foundations on which the game would be based uh, would be realistic. It would use real world u- units of measure, yards and pounds and, and miles per hour. Sure, and, sure, I, sure. As a Canadian, I can't say these words and feel good about it, but as, as somebody who works in Europe, I can accept this. Uh, there'll be things people understood. Instead of using some crazy unit like Zorkovids for money, he just used dollar sign called a generic dollar. Um, rather than start the game out with uh, people having weird powers, people start out with pretty average physical strength and size and weight and moderately plausible levels of competence and things. This is what he meant. He meant that there would be a bridge between the worlds of imagination and the world you live in. And that bridge would be formed by units you know about, behavior you understand, uh, concepts that exist in the real world. And that's what he actually meant. But 
yeah, I always say unfortunately. That's an unfair choice of word. But from my point of view, as someone who's responsible for putting words on paper and then facing criticism for them, it's unfortunate that some people take that beyond the level he intended it and bring that into the realm of, well, everyone's got to be exactly like in the real world. If a 300 pound man wrestles a 110 pound woman, he will win because he's 300 pounds. End of discussion. Or if I take my car and I drive at this ramp and hit the gas, go all the way up the ramp, well, I'm going to do some basic physics and we'll know exactly how far I can jump. And go, yoo-hoo, yee-haw, leaning on the horn will not change that. But the thing is that most gamers don't really want that degree of harsh judgmental realism in the game. I mean, most people want to know, if I play uh, a 97-pound ninja girl, she can beat anyone's butt because she's a ninja girl. It doesn't matter if she weighs 97 pounds or is a girl. And if she gets in a car and goes, woohoo, or whatever the silent ninja equivalent is, and it goes over a ramp, it'll go further because it's awesome. Right. The rule of awesome should matter. And I'd argue that um, the rule of awesome has always been important to gamers, even if realism never has. And in the modern day games industry, I think the rule of awesome is being recognized as being more important than it used to be. I think an awful lot of game designers are saying it's not lazy game design to say, if this is fun and dramatic and cool to the players, it's okay with me in the game, in the rule set. Game designers have gotten past that. And they realize, no, it is okay. It's not lazy. Because actually, having developed such rules, I can say outright, a good set of dramatic rules. Dramatic rules that work and that are fun and don't make someone godlike or don't hobble someone. A set of rules that are fun for everyone at the table, not just one person. And for the GM, too, not just the players. That's actually very hard to do. In fact, it's a lot harder to do than a set of realistic rules because I'm a former physicist, 10 years in physics. If I want to sit down and just develop a mathematical simulation, I can do that. It's straightforward. i got a physics guide in my hand. I have books I can consult. That's relatively easy. It's a headache of research, and it's annoying to write, right. but it's not difficult. It's not challenging in the design sense, whereas dramatic rules are very challenging for from the design perspective. And I think game designers now reach a level of maturity and experience. They have not failed or not so successful past games to draw upon. And they can do those things now with some degree of confidence, with uh, some knowledge that people buy the game and actually say, hey, this is kind of fun, not the universal, it sucks, because I didn't like it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was kind of awesome. Um, good. I, don't know, I, just, I, I enjoyed that uh, discussion. I like talking about the industry and where it's going. Um, one of the things that, that sort of goes into, and I think that ties into a lot of what you're saying, is Dungeon Fantasy with 15 and apparently almost 16, based on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the leaks that have happened. There's a Dungeon Fantasy, 16th Dungeon Fantasy volume pending, um, which I'm sure that lots of people, including myself, are looking forward to. But there are 15 of them, I mean, which is awesome, right? I mean, you know, that's almost as many sequels as Star Trek has movies. Um, and uh, so why do you think that's worked so well? Well, I mean, first off, I'm not going to take too much credit because there is the fact that it's 60, but they are short. So maybe if they were all put together, it would be merely four or 500 pages and stuff. So it's only equivalent of, say, three to five old-timey supplements. But if you think about it, you know, we didn't actually do three to five old-timey supplements on any genre that I can think of offhand. Uh, we would have lots on individual genres and maybe one or two, volume one, two kind of follow-ups. But that was it. So it has gone far. And the reason it's gone far, I think, in part, is because it actually harkens back to what I said previously, which is that games like Pathfinder, like class-level systems, people can jump right in. They know what to expect. They know what a given class is. They know what the power level, a given level is going to be. They know they have a small list of things from which to pick. They're not building on points. They're not uh, throwing things together. That required GM judgment at every step of the way. You're not fighting a battle to make your character. And GURPS can be like, well, unfortunately, GURPS can very much be fighting a battle to make your character, either because the GM doesn't want you to have something, the other players are not so cool with what you're doing, there's a house rule you don't know about, or you just don't want to sit down and spend all those points. Dungeon Fantasy is 250 points. Say so you're insane and you want to spend it on one point items. That's 250 purchases. That's, that's absolutely nuts. I mean, that would be a lot of choice. But what Dungeon Fantasy does is it, I would say, prefabricates or uh, puts things in such narrow terms that you're really, really restricted and only make one or two sorts of characters. But it does pare down the list. It does pare down all the lists. The GM does not have to sit down and say, these are the advantages. Here's the skills I'm using. They're already pared down. The GM does not have to say, here's the character types I want to allow. They're already 
defined. The GM does not have to say, here's the genre we're gaming in, because it's a well-defined it genre already, genre, yeah. and Dutch fantasy had low-hanging fruit there, because it's a genre most people know well. But it also really circumscribes the genre quite a bit. It it addresses what you're going to be doing in a campaign. You're not going to be spending points on the history skill, because that doesn't exist. Why? Because who sits around looking up history books in a campaign, which is all about taking out your weapons and magic spells, blasting the enemies, taking their stuff, getting richer, buying better swords, learning better magic spells, wash, rinse, repeat. And Dungeon Fantasy just accepts that that could be fun, rather than poo-pooing it, saying, oh, it's not mature, it's not a cool style of gaming, why would you do that? And then says, okay, but even though it's not mature, not cool, whatever, hey, it's still a point-based system with an awful lot of stuff, and we can add a little extra spin that isn't present in system future, purely about the hack and slash. Which it does. I, I have got that in there lots of ways. And sometimes it's, it's sneaky ways, like including a not so violent skill and giving it a use. You know, there are uses for some skills in Dungeon of Fantasy too. You'd be surprised at. If you really sit down and read through that, you'll see there's an awful lot of stuff in there, which is just about hacking, killing, and taking treasure. There's actually rules in there for finding quests and selling maps and singing songs and deceiving people with words instead of violence and so on. It's all in there. Uh, that's something in a game that's pure hack and slash can't handle. Gerbs can. Likewise, if you look at some of the character types, I, I like to say classes, but they're basically classes. If you look at some of the character types, there are ones in there which aren't tend to be violent, first and foremost. Uh, the ones in Dungeon Fantasy IV, the Artificer and the, uh, and the Scholar, are not violent character types. The Innkeeper from Dungeon Fantasy X, while he bashes people with a pan when they get him unruly, he's not a violent character type. Uh, and there's even some of the ones that I think are traditionally kind of violent or at least oriented toward conflict, aren't. I mean, the old masters put together the great Dungeon Fantasy IX, which I really love. Summers is a cool book. And those spellcasters, if you look at them, aside from the elementals, Jaren's around blowing stuff up with fireballs, so fair enough, he's destructive, your classic wizard. Most of those types are actually really traditional, uh, traditional mystics. You've got the, the demonologist who deals with entities from another world, usually evil, and he doesn't have to be throwing curses on people and murdering them and summoning demons to eat their souls. He could be there to fight demons, deal with demons, and Phil cleverly wedged in the possibility that he actually is a negotiator of demons, or someone who handles social problems with demons in the campaign. Ditto the necromancer. Yeah, he can have a hundred zombie servants and turn into a lich and get all creepy and all that. That's, that's there for people who want it. But it's not the only possibility. He can also be... Um, Someone that does much the same thing deals with monsters on a, almost a social level, or at least on a spiritual level, as opposed to on a purely violent level. And the shaman is perhaps the best example, being characters as a psychopomp and a ritualist, and not a pure violent adventure type. And the thing is that that combination is what makes Dungeon Fantasy successful. It's the mixture of things people know and recognize, like I said, what I call the low-hanging fruit, the violence, the slash and the hack, the fireballs, the loot, all that good stuff. It's there. It's not missing. It's done in spades. The Dungeon Fantasy XI power-ups throws in boatloads of ways to get better at just that stuff and nothing else. At the same time, there's enough of the underlying generic point build system there that things that go a little out of genre, or that would cost points that maybe aren't so so well spent in a fantasy campaign, still have meaning. They could still be uh, put in there if people want to have more thoughtful characters. And you could have a principle of a party of, of adventurers where Three people are playing, say, I don't know, uh, a wizard who blasts things a fireball, uh, a knight who goes around whacking stuff with a sword, and a thief who goes around shanking people in the back and taking their wallets. And at the same time, three other people in that exact same group could be playing a very thoughtful cleric built with some of the more unusual cleric modifications in Dungeon Fantasy VII, who's, say, a cleric of love who goes around trying to get people not to fight, wearing a skippy outfit, saying, look how sexy I am, look how the power of the love god. And you can have uh, someone else there who's a. I can't a unsee that, you know. <laughs> now I'm, picture, <laughs> I'm picturing you in a skimpy outfit saying, "Play to the love god." Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's not this, my thing, but you know, someone could do it. Just someone not could do it. Okay, you know. But, and, yeah. and the shaman could be there, being a, like a classic shaman, drinking mushroom tea and seeing crazy visions, and talking to spirits of, and spirit wolves and things. And there could be a, a an innkeeper there whose main job is keeping uh, keeping people fed. And he's really good at it because he's got 250 points spent on keeping people fed so they don't starve and they eat very well and they have very high morale and everything. And you get on that party work. And as long as the people playing the hack and slash characters weren't being too aggressive about pull your weight, you 
bastards, get in the combat and do what you're supposed to do. As long as the people playing the not so combative characters are not being jerks about say, you're so immature, you know, why are you always hacking, killing, and looting? Why can't you have a real character? As long as that's not going on, and that's not an issue of the game, that's an issue of the players. Right. Then it handles that. And that's why and that's one of the things that makes it very successful about Dungeon Pass. Is it handles a style of play which is encompassing, but also accessible to an awful lot of people. Cool. Um, what other genres do you think could benefit from that same treatment and maybe partially uh, drink from that uh, glass of success? Well, we, we've had moderate success with the action series already, as you know. Um, the only reason it hasn't expanded more is because it's just the nature of RPGs that people are more interested in fantasy than they are in modern day action. It's nothing to do with action sucking or not being a, a fun genre or not being able to succeed there. We have gone to the three books and there'll probably be others. Uh, Jason's Monster Hunters has gone, has gone to several books. We have more in more planned, hopefully, and it's going to spin off even into um, into the Ritual Path Magic uh, supplement for Thaumatology sometime in the hopefully not too distant future because it's a cool magic system. Mm -hmm. For that matter, action spun off. Gun Fu was very much a spin off from action. Yeah. So there, there's a, those genres are obviously have a lot of room for uh, a lot of room for success in that realm because they're first and foremost very action oriented genres. Action from its title, obviously, but also the fact that it's about shooting guns and hacking computers with the bad guys chopping down the door with a fire axe and so on. And Monster Hunters is about taking on vampires that are actually your member of Congress and um, ducking down alleyways as the cops come after you've had a huge gunfight with werewolves and things. Very exciting, very dynamic stuff, which at the same time has flip side action could mean toward more uh, something more like Sneakers or Ocean's Eleven, where you're plotting and uh, coming up with a big scheme with lots of moving parts, lots of team members and specialists, and you're almost going up against the conspiracy, and you're, all, you're, you've almost failed if it comes to, comes to violence. You want to pull right. it off of the violence at all. Monster Hunters is the same way. Yes, it can be hacking down werewolves with a big old silver axe, shooting your machine gun full of flaming bullets at the, at the vampires. It can be like that, but at the same time, it can be very conspiracy-oriented. It can be all veiled behind the scenes. You know, more, uh, I guess, more more underworld than Blade, you know? Blade pretty much had no problem at all jumping down the middle of a highway with a big old bladed boomerang or whatever he calls that thing and a katana on his back. And, oh, you saw me killing people. And, it, and Whistler says, oh, you can't be killing people. People will know you're out there. Everybody knows he's out there. He's not subtle. Whereas Underworld, we at least have this pretense that people are trying to masquerade, not let on that supernatural entities in the world. Although they do, in fact, have raging fights and subways as well for the players who couldn't, who couldn't wait. And... And that's the thing, though, is that you have that yeah. that level of conspiracy there, as well as that level of violence. And I think that 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 those uh, that those mixtures are what's very important for future genre treatments we do. If there's going to be a future genre treatment, it's going to succeed. First, it's got to be an accessible genre people like. It's got to have expectations that people can play to. Uh, Dungeon Fantasy had, you know, you have clerics who heal, you got wizards with the fireballs, you have thieves who steal things and so on. Action has, there's a guy who likes to blow stuff up. There's the guy who likes to pick locks and wear a, you know, and, and well, it's usually, usually it's a hot woman in a tight cat suit, let's be honest. But the point is that there's rules. And there's the guy with a gun, he shoots things in. He's a very good shot. The guy drives like a maniac and never screws up in a car chase. And Monster Hunters has it too. You've got the witch or occultist who's very good at the, at, at the secret world. You've got the upfront kung fu, kick people's butts, put a spear through their heart, martial arts kind of dude, you've got somebody who's good with guns, you usually have somebody who's good with um, weird science, coming up with all the weird weapons they use, so you have these clearly defined roles right. that everyone expects, you've got clearly defined bad guys, whether it's tentacle monsters that you uh, take treasure from in Dungeon Fantasy, or a uh, scuzzy looking uh, scumbag with a, you know, his bandana and his machete in action, or uh, in, in, in Monster Hunters, it's some vampire who's dressed up in a suit that's very proper and you know darn well he's running things behind the scene and you have to take him out without too much violence. And these are well-known expectations. And players can play both action-oriented and thoughtful characters. So to take an example, uh, I think Space Opera would be a good one. I'd like to go there someday. Because there you've got clearly defined rules. You've got the square jaw, you know, Jim McCurk, leader, captain type. You've got the swashbuckling type, whether the swashbuckler takes the form of the somewhat subdued junior officer or the 
outright crazy Han Solo type. You've got um, the token alien. You've got the machine of logic, who's sometimes the token alien, sometimes it's an android, sometimes just a human with odd mental makeup, like Mentats in uh, Doom. You've got um, all these other specialist roles, engineers, technicians, very striped, fighter pilots, mecha pilots, you name it. So you've got the well-defined roles, you have well-defined tropes, you've got things like psychic powers, usually they take two flavors, there's evil bad guy psychics, and there's nice empathic good guy psychics. You've got uh, crazy science, fashion like travel, ray guns, missiles, and so on. And uh, you've got various types of various types of foes, inevitably creepy, ugly aliens are also bad, you know, they're bad and they're ugly, the good guy ugly aliens who are lovable despite being ugly and very creepy, and um, bad guy humans who are betraying their own species, and so on and so on and so on. You've got all these elements, and then you've got this possibility, uh, this range of everything from action to thoughtfulness. You've got, on one hand, fighter pilots and crazy people who swing from door frames while they're throwing their big two, you know, Two, two fisted punches and two footed kicks and all that insanity, and shooting great guns for his ass punches later. But the other side of the coin, you get people who talk the techno babble and sit around with the computer and solve the technical problems and reverse the polarity or whatever, and so on. And they get to solve things thoughtfully. And even total uncombatant types who are empathic or, or, or diplomatic and who deal with uh, the strange looking aliens or the evil humans through mind games and talk and chatter. And that's a good example of a genre I think could work. And I, I think anything which, in principle, anything which has that scope of character roles alongside well-known, well-defined tropes could be done in this way. Whereas something which doesn't have much range, something where all the characters have to be violent or where um, all the characters have to be thoughtful and where the range of plot devices is less, uh, I think, less less constrained. I think it'd be harder to do. Like, it'd be harder to do a soap opera because in soap opera, everyone is kind of nonviolent. So do, yeah, they have expertise, but they're fundamentally all social characters and talkers. And there's no well-defined genre expectations. There are soap operas out there where some of the characters were outright supernatural. I mean, I don't watch soap operas, but I've heard that there are soap operas where ghosts of previous characters come back and where some of the people are apparently aliens and things. And soap operas likewise can be very grounded and very set oriented. Now, all this entire soap opera is at a hospital. This entire soap opera is in this one room. I mean, these things exist. Most of, um, you know, most of the classic soap operas are, are, are very well defined, but they're with, with a certain physical set of space, a certain right. dramatic space. But if you look at that, that physical dramatic space is so different from the other physical dramatic space soap operas is set that it would be very hard to come up with a generic soap opera. Yeah. No, it's interesting because you, you say some things that really resonate because a lot of what you're describing, I think, are the things that make successful multi-season TV shows. And Probably, yeah. Right? And, and even when you take something like one of the shows that I got into and the wonderful thing about things like Netflix is you can watch them all at once, but then you're you know starved for, for things that come after is was a show called The Unit, which was about Delta Force. And okay. you think, oh, well, that's kind of boring because, well, they're all just badass soldiers. But they're not, because they're special forces, and yes, they're all badass soldiers, but they've all got these distinguishing characteristics. Well, this person's an electronics expert, this person can fly any vehicle, and it's exactly the same thing, but it's like, in a way, it's a great role-playing party, because everybody can play in the combat zone, but yeah. you've got all of these other things. And so if you build your differentiation on top of a general level of badassery, you can still have all of this uh, flavor and plot personal driven moments in the spotlight with all without being like oh each and every single one of us is a clone trooper with no differentiation a game that i played in grad school to not terribly a lot of enjoyment <laughs> someone uh, someone ran that one um which was less successful than we we asked a guy to come in to run a gurps campaign and as it turned out he had a, a homebrew system that he wanted to try out and he managed to layer that on top of our characters in a way that very quickly we weren't playing what we thought we were. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was short-lived and therefore it was worth the time that it took. Um, last question, I guess. Uh, well, well, I want to do... Since uh, we seem to have seen the, uh, re the reopening, hopefully, of, of the GURPS pipeline, um, GURPS content is basically fan-driven. You know, you and some, some core people do a lot of work, um, but... You know, really, it's it's 
write a proposal, get it approved, and then go. Um, as the pipeline for GURPS clears, um, what message do you have for prospective creators? Well, the first demo support message, and yeah, this probably comes from our sponsors, so to speak, I suppose for me personally, is do keep a do keep an eye on the wish list. It isn't something we consider to be restrictive or a constraint on what we will and won't accept, but it is a first level filter. And if you're new, especially, you don't want to try to approach some topic that we've not expressed an interest in because you you're you're fighting an uphill battle. Then you're both fighting the fact you're unknown and fighting the fact that we didn't have a first order interest in having that supplement done. So we're going to be asking ourselves: Do we want this person to be the one who gets the special lead to do something we're not so sure we'll sell, or do we want to have a, an author we know and has done stuff for us? tackle something like that because then at least we know the name will sell a few and yeah it's sales oriented all it's but it's a business so i can't i can't deny that that's very important to us um as well take the time it takes to read the style guides and formatting guides i know that stuff's really boring i i hate it i i i i'll outright say if i could take this book right here this is the uh the associated press style book if i could take this book right here and just i don't know put it in a fire, I'd probably be happier. Um, it doesn't actually make me happy. And I'm not going to turn my camera around because then I'll get to sit down, but I got a whole wall of things. They don't make me happy either. They're all style guides. It's like dictionary, dictionary, biographical site media, more dictionary. Oh, look, another dictionary. One, two, three, four style guides, two guides to grammar. And oh, there's a thesaurus here too. And that's just in paper. And now I've got digital guides as well. It's really bloody boring. I won't deny that. But, and it's a big but, the marketability of not your game to gamers, but of your manuscripts to us as publishers is based on how little cost we think we can produce the product for. Um, if we think it's going to be a hard edit, then we're less likely to be interested. And when I say hard edit, it could mean a lot of things. It does not necessarily mean the English language. In fact, as an editor, uh, you, know, you can tell I'm an editor because I'm kind of bold a bit here and, and look kind of boring. Um, and I wear glasses, but as an editor, I can tell you, fixing the English is the easy part. I can fix English quickly. I can fix English in thousands of words in no time at all. But fixing the other things we want is very difficult. And people haven't followed the style guide, that's what I end up doing. And little things like knowing which game terms are capitalized, where we both fix, how we format character sheets in print. Yeah, it's, it, it's not part of the fun of writing for games. But I can't deny that it's an important part of doing it well and right. Uh, so that's important, and I'd rather have somebody be late with their product, be late with their project, and because they said, oh, you know, I was going to be on time, and then I spent two weeks reading your style guide, and it was 40 pages long, and just internalizing that. It was a page at night, and I was going crazy. I'd rather have somebody say that to me, be late. I'll forgive that. Then to rush, hmm. not have, having led any thought at all to proper style, and put me in a situation where I'm going to have to go to my managing editor or at least to Stephen at E23, who manages E23, and who's my boss in that regard, and say, oh, sorry, the product you wanted to release is not going to be out in time because we're still editing it, or worse, far worse, oh, sorry, this product's going to take twice as long to edit, which means twice as many editorial hours, which means twice as much overhead expense, which right. means profit will take that much longer to show. So that, that's another pointer. And the last pointer I would have is... Don't get so immersed in your subject that you forget that you're writing for an audience. And that's a complicated one, and I'm not sure how easily I can explain it, but I see it often. So I'll just say, you may think your topic is the coolest thing since sliced bread, but it's important to remember that people who are playing a generic game are going to be fitting into possibly a setting you've never heard of, very probably a genre you don't play, quite likely a style of play that isn't your own. And your enthusiasm is usually found in one or all three of those things. It will not come across to people. What will come across to people is your knowledgeability, sure. But just remember that you have to be able to reach out to people and pull them into what you've written and make it interesting to them. Which is why, even though I have some very strongly held opinions, everyone knows them, they see me writing on forums, blah, 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 you're asking about my opinions, about how you should do this, or you ought to do that. That isn't in my books, and the reason it's not in my books is because I know that just because I feel that way doesn't mean 
people buy a book care. I don't like zombie apocalypses where the world is being over on the zombies, the player characters, the heroes, whatever, can turn into zombies, the world's gone going to hell and it's going to end with everyone dead. I don't like that. I think those movies are stupid. I don't like those zombie movies. I like the zombie stories where the, the people are resourceful. They, for the most part, survive, or if they don't survive, it's because they had a chance and they screwed up. And where the zombies aren't necessarily overrunning and destroying the whole world. There's a threat of that, but the zombies are there primarily and first and foremost as a plot device. And, for example, I know this will make me unpopular with fans of George Romero, but some of my favorite zombie stories are the Resident Evil stories. You get these specific characters who are very capable. They, for the most part, survive, and some of them don't. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a zombie movie. And the zombies, until late in the arc, they haven't taken over the world. They're still confined, at first to an installation, then to a city, then to a, a larger region, and finally they take they de annihilate the world. And that's much more interesting. So in my zombies book, what do I have? Well, I have all the zombie stuff, not just the not just the stuff I like, where the zombies are confined to a secret lab and the player characters can live. But I spent as much time or more on the stories where the zombies are taking over the world, eating everyone, and where everyone dies and everyone's incompetent. Because I know, as a writer of zombie stories, there's other people out there who like that stuff. And the same goes for, for your book if you're a freelancer. You have to set aside your personal bias sometimes and realize that, well, it's a generic game, there's lots of styles of play, and this is going to possibly combine with things I'm not even thinking about. You have to make sure your game reaches those people. This is most important with adventures. If you're going to write an adventure, it's very important to realize people have established campaigns, they've established house rules and established groups. They're not going to want an adventure, which can only happen in this one city which can't exist in their world, with character types no one's playing, in a genre no one much likes, that has an outcome that can only be world-shattering or fatal for the player characters. That's, that's hopeless, because in an ongoing campaign, the specific characters already have lives and hometowns and expectations. Um, it's not going to fly. It's just not going to fly. So you've got to make sure your adventure has hooks to all kinds of gamers. It doesn't mean you have to write a generic adventure that has no specific expectations. Well, that's impossible. You can't do that. But what you can do is throw in asides on, okay, how do you fit into a higher power group? How do you put it into an existing game world? How do you uh, set things up so that this adventure is a side quest for really powerful characters instead of the be-all end-all for new characters. And a good example of that would be Matt Rigsby's Dungeon Fantasy Adventure 1, uh, Mirror of the Fire Demon. He was very good about making it flexible. There's variable numbers of bad guys, the bad guys get very in power. He says, okay, this is a desert region, put it in your game world where there's deserts. Uh, if you don't have these kinds of bad guys, just don't include them. If you do have these kinds of bad guys, they match with my bad guys this way. Uh, and so on. And that's a great way to handle an adventure. That's how an adventure should be written for a generic system. So those are the things I think are most important, after which is all the secondary stuff, which applies to all kinds of writing, I would say. And for writing for a game, among those things, is know your game system. But I would say that's in my second category of things. It's just an element of style and formatting. You know, you know, how, the rules are, you know how the rules work, you know how the points add up. It, I consider that boring. It's a technical task. You have to be good at it to write for us. But I don't consider it a separate thing, because every game designer out there who has someone coming into freelance work on her system is going to say to you, oh, uh, I want you to actually be working in my system, not some system that doesn't exist or something you just made up that's in your head. OK. Um, do you have any parting shots? Uh, mostly just thanks for giving me the chance to yak. I, I like to get get the word out there, uh, let people know there's a real human behind this. and I only wish I could have uh, some of my other writers come in and form a bit of a panel here because it's a group effort for us. I, 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 I'm the name on, uh, in the credits, Gerb's line editor, this guy, but I don't take credit for most of what gets out there. I read most of what goes out there and I have some pull, I guess, but uh, I, I would encourage people to remember that we're real people back here working hard, often for not very many dollars uh, to get the games out there. and. We're more than happy to get the word out, not because we want to get rich or famous, but because we want to, you know, we have all these great concepts in our head, we want to create to people. So I really am thankful for the opportunity to do that.